You're listening to a podcast from leadculture.com. How did Rugby League grow internationally? How, how did Rugby League grow across the globe? Um, with great difficulty, obviously. I mean, I think one of the, you know, I mean, one of the things, I think it's an amazing story that Rugby League was able to grow because of the opposition and the sort of institutional strength that Rugby Union had, but nevertheless it did. I think one of the reasons for that is because as Rugby developed, um, inevitably, when it became uh, a mass popular spectator sport, it inevitably developed towards professionalism and to being a a more spectacular game. You know, people you know, people always want to see passing, as we said before, passing, handling, running, scoring tries. That's a spectacular part of the game. And the best players obviously demand that, you know, they're entertainers, they demand a wage. And that was the case in the north of England in the 1880s and 1890s that led to the split in 1895. And it was a case in Australia and parts of New Zealand. Australia was a, had a very similar social makeup to the north of England. In uh, New South Wales and Queensland, the two states where rugby league was where rugby was the most popular game, it became a huge spectator sport. It was a sport that was supported by all classes in society, from you know the most elite all the way down to to the working classes, the dockers, miners, just as it was in the north of England. And because the the elite of the game wanted to retain control, they felt the best way to do that was to impose amateurism and forbid players to receive any any money for playing the game. And in order to um, maintain an amateur course, they have to have a very harsh system of discipline and to expel and suspend anybody who is suspected of being paid. And that's what happened in the north of England, where the clubs and players started to be suspended. And so eventually by 1895, the northern clubs said, well, enough is enough. We can't continue with this. We're going to form our own organisation, the Northern Union, where we're going to play the game as we want and we're going to pay the players as we want. And eventually that happened in, in Australia, where the the fact that players didn't receive any, or technically didn't receive any compensation for playing the game, they didn't receive insurance payments when they were injured, led led to essentially to a players' revolt in 1907 and led to the formation of the New South Wales Rugby League and then a year later, the Queensland Rugby Association. In, and a similar thing, had hap- and the catalyst for that was to some extent, although it would have happened anywhere probably, the catalyst for that was the 1907 Albert Baskerville New Zealand Rugby League pioneers. And again, they were really the, um, the product of a player revolt. In 1905, I mean, New Zealand, the game had, the game had become the national sport of New Zealand very rapidly. So by 1900, it was the most important sport in New Zealand, uh, by far and away. And they, um, in 1905, the New Zealand national team, the All Blacks, toured Britain and Ireland and, uh, arrived back in, uh, New Zealand, national heroes. Uh, the tour made a huge profit, but the players re- didn't receive a single penny. Many of them were actually in debt when they got back from the tour because they had to take time off work. They weren't supposed to receive compensation as per the rugby union amateur rules. And so there was a lot of disquiet in New Zealand rugby union, just as there was in Australian rugby union. And the, the 1907 basketball tourists were essentially, um, essentially players at the top level of the game in New Zealand and said, well, enough is enough. We're making all this money for the New Zealand Rugby Union. You know, we're, the people say we're national heroes and we don't receive a penny for that. And the Baskerville Tour really was the, uh, brought all those elements together. And, you know, they were incredibly successful both on and off the pitch when they came to, um, when they came to Britain in 1907. And that real, that tour really was the, the spark that demonstrates the Australians that professional rugby as they saw it and particularly the Northern Union rules would work for them. And, and, and so they, um, in Australia, the majority of rugby, uh, players and supporters went with a new game and rugby union basically became, with one or two exceptions, basically became the, the sport of the private schools in, um, New South Wales and Queensland, uh, which it still is today. 
And in uh, in New Zealand, it wasn't quite as successful when it split because partly because the New Zealand rugby union took a lot of active measures to try and undermine rugby league, and so rugby league became the sport of by and large the industrial workers in in Auckland and in the mining districts in the west coast of the South area and um, of the South Island. Sorry, pretty much the same constituencies. It was strong with strong in. In, uh, in the north of England and, Aust- and, and Australia. The interesting question, which is, and people often ask this, is what about South Wales? Exactly the same social background, exactly the same makeup, very working class, industrial sport. They too like to see an open running passing game. It was a Welsh who invented three three quarters in the 1880s. Up until the 1880s, the uh, teams had only played with three three quarters and nine men in the pack. Uh, the Welsh decided, well, they like running and passing. That's the most important thing. They brought developed the 4 quarter system. But they didn't go to rugby league because the RFU compromised. In 1896, the Welsh Rugby Union suspended Games of England because they'd been accused of professionalism by paying their star pl- by organising a testimonial for their star player, Arthur Gould. And it looked for, for a long time, well, for a number of months, that they would split and that would have been uh, an incredible boost to the Northern Union because it would have meant that England and Wales could have played each other. There would have been big clubs in South Wales would have gone over to the Northern Union, Cardiff, Swansea, uh, Newport, teams like that. By that time, the Rugby Union realised that that would have been a almost a mortal blow to its authority. And so they, they the Rugby Union backed down and said, well, it's not a matter of principle for us. You know, We're prepared to compromise in this instance in a way that they weren't with the clubs in the North of England. And in a sense, an, ag- an informal, ag- unspoken agreement was reached by the Rugby Union, Welsh Rugby Union, that the the Welsh would, put, would the Welsh Rugby Union would pretend that it didn't pay its players, and the Rugby Football Union in England would pretend that they believed that the Welsh didn't pay their players, but obviously they did uh, for a long, long time, and that headed off a split. You know, the Rugby Union played a you know, played a very clever game in in attempting to shore up their authority after the 1895 split. So for a long time, we just had the three countries, obviously Australia, New Zealand, and and England, if you like, or Great Britain. And it was a long time before the fourth country came along, France. Yeah, um, it wasn't for the want of trying. I mean, there was, a, there was a big desire to spread the game. And a lot of the early internationals before the First World War were played, uh, well, Stamford Bridge, for example, Glasgow, uh, Villa Park in Birmingham. And so the Northern Union did try and spread the game around Britain, but it, it, in a sense, it was up against not so much rugby union in Britain, but, but soccer. Soccer just grew to uh, an incredible extent in the 1900s. And it was a real, it was a real threat to, well, to both uh, rugby league and rugby union. For a while, rugby league was kind of locked into the North of England. There, were, there was Welsh clubs and a club in Coventry before the First World War. But the simple economics of professional sport meant that they, they really struggled and um, really the First World War put paid to them. And it wasn't until the early 1930s that the the next big opportunity uh, emerged, which was in France. And, well, as we talked about earlier, uh, rugby started in France in the 1880s, 1890s, and uh, in a very similar way to what it had in, in, other, in the English-speaking countries. But again, just as in Australia, it became a mass spectator sport, hugely important. It was well known that players were being paid or given jobs by French clubs. The the leaders of French rugby were not very were not very comfortable with the fact that the the game, as they saw it, was slipping out of their hands. And just as in in England in the eighteen eighties and eighteen nineties it slowly became clear to the Rugby Football Union that the best clubs were no longer the elite clubs of Blackheath, Richmond, Harlequins, uh, Oxford and Cambridge Universities, and that there were actually, you know, it was, it was Bradford, Wigan, Leeds, Hull, Warrington, these clubs that were uh, the, the best in the country. Similar thing happened in France. So by the 1920s, the elite French clubs in Paris and Bordeaux uh, had been swept aside by you know smaller clubs in the south of France in the, what became the heartland of well, both rugby league and rugby union. 
and that teams like Les Ignan, you know, great French rugby league team, Pepillon uh, in rugby union, uh, later gave birth to uh, uh, Trust Catalan, uh, who became part of uh, Catalan Dragons, that these clubs that, were, that weren't that were elite clubs were dominating the game. They also knew that players were being paid, and more to the point that players wanted to be paid openly and above board. Things came to a head in the early 1930s when the French Rugby Union was expelled from the Rugby Union Five Nations Tournament because the Rugby Football Union, which controlled the International Rugby Union then, uh, thought that the French were too violent and that the crowds were too uh, well, the crowds were too violent as well and too dangerous. I think that I think there was a lot of exaggeration in that, and it's certainly the case that the Rugby Union, the leaders of Rugby, really didn't weren't really interested in countries that didn't speak English, to be honest. And in fact, at one point, you can actually read the minutes where they, somebody actually proposes that they should um, stop, uh, break off relations with non-English speaking countries. So you can tell how sort of nationalistic they were. In, so, but in France, the situation was, by the early 1930s, it became very similar to what it was in the north of England in the 1890s or Australia in 1905, 1906, 1907. And eventually, um, the, the catalyst for the formation of, of rugby league in France was uh, Jean Gallier, who was a great French uh, for, rugby union forward uh, and also French heavyweight boxing champion, really played the, the role of Al- that Albert Baskerville played in New Zealand and was the catalyst for um, organising players into, an, into a rugby league competition. And in 1934, the French rugby league was formed and it became a phenomenon within a few years. Within five, six years, it was it had almost as many clubs as French Rugby Union, you know, two, three hundred. And certainly in terms of popularity, it was rapidly gaining on, on Rugby Union. It had much higher international profile because uh, it was playing England and Wales, whereas uh, the French were banned from French Rugby Union, were banned from playing in, in the Five Nations Championship. Uh, and so everything was going right for Rugby, for rugby League in, in France. And if the war hadn't broken out, no doubt it would have. I, I don't think even rugby union historians admit that if the war, World War Two hadn't broke out, rugby league would have eclipsed rugby union and it would have become the main game, the main winter game of France. But as I'm sure most people listening to the podcast know, the the v, the collaborationist Vichy government in France in um, in 1940, France had been invaded by Germany, and the country was was the northern part of the country was occupied by the Germans directly. But the southern part of the country was ruled by what was effectively a puppet government um, that was in alliance with the Germans, uh, led by Marshal Pétain, who um, ruled from uh, city government was in the uh, in the spa town of Vichy, um, which is kind of like the Harrogate of France or the Bath of France. And the Vichy government decided that all professional sports should be banned. Only amateur sports should be played in, in Vichy. In the Vichy, under the Vichy regime. However, it went much deeper than that because although, so sports that had, sports that were played professional, like soccer, weren't banned. They just played an amateur, amateur soccer. But rugby league was forcibly integrated into rugby union. And this was a very, very deliberate policy. The, the Ministry of Sport was led by people who were either, either uh, officials of the French rugby union or very close to um, the people in the French Rugby Union. All rugby league clubs were, were closed down and forced to merge with their rugby union clubs. All rugby league players were forced to play rub, uh, rugby union. And the assets of the French Rugby League uh, were confiscated by the government. It's still unclear what actually happened to them, although the, the assumption is, uh, you know, I think, uh, and nobody seriously denied this, was that the the assets, the buildings, the capital and everything else were, were given to French Rugby Union. And the fact that, you know, we still don't know after 70 odd years what actually happened shows how deep this ran, uh, you know, how deeply involved the French establishment and the French Rugby Union were the attempted murder of a, uh, of a sport. And, you know, I, think it's, I don't think anybody could disagree that that's what it was, attempted murder. And rugby league never really recovered from that because even after the war when it started, the, there's a, um, you read the accounts of French rugby league administrators when they go back to, uh, immediately with the war's over, they go to the French government and say, we want to, you know, we've restarted, we need to get our assets back and we want to become part of the national sports programme. And the people they have to negotiate with in the French Ministry of Sport 
our officials in the French Rugby Union. It's actually the people who collaborated with the collaborationist Vichy government are the ones that are still in power. And the people who were the victims of the Vichy government, the French Rugby League, are still the people who are being discriminated against. And so there was absolutely no justice. And although, as I'm sure people will be aware, that there's a great French team under Puy Gobert in the 19, uh, late 1940s and throughout the 1950s, Rugby League was restricted in uh, the number of professional players it could have. It, uh, it wasn't played extensively in the schools. It wasn't played in the universities. It was essentially kept in a very uh, in a very tight straitjacket, so it didn't threaten rugby union. And the, you know, the game in France is still living with the consequences of that. You have to say, when you look at the obstacles that were put in the way of French rugby league, it's amazing that the sport ever survived. And I think it's a tribute to everybody who's ever been involved in French rugby league uh, that they believed in the game and were prepared to fight for the game. That it's still around today because otherwise, if the you know the government agencies and the French rugby union had have had their way, then the game would have been dead, and we'd be talking about you know how rugby league, uh, how rugby league died in the Second World War and never reemerged. So you know it's a it's a fantastic story of of heroism in the face of you know very vicious adversity. There are, I suppose, there are some positives. We we do get the the first rugby league World Cup from from the French. Yeah, absolutely. So the other, yeah, there's um, the French, despite these disadvantages, the French played an incredibly positive role. So even in the late 1930s, they're talking about um, the potential of organising a World Cup tournament. And remember, French sport is very outward looking. It was the French who started FIFA in 1904, and they were really the um, uh, one of the the moving forces in European soccer for the World Cup to come to come to Europe in the 1930s. And obviously, the, the World Cup is called the Jurema Trophy after the French football administrator. And it was the same in rugby league. So they proposed the World Cup in the late 1930s. Nothing nothing actually happened for a variety of reasons. And then in the late 1940s, Paul Barrier who was a, a leader of the French resistance, who was uh, uh, became president of the French Rugby League when he was, he was quite young, his late 20s, early 30s, I think, proposed uh, that uh, we should have a World Cup tournament. And the first one was held in 1954. Stunning success. And, uh, you know, I think it's a case that we never quite capitalised on that. The I think when you think about the context of it, um, we Rugby League was really the, the second major sport after soccer to organise a World Cup tournament. That's how early it was and how innovative and pioneering the idea was. But it was held back due to, I think, parochialism on the part of the uh, British and Australian administrators and a, uh, a failure really to just understand how important international and world tournaments were. And as we can see today, it's a, it's a motor force of, of most sport. But the other thing that the French did is that the French were also sort of inherently and naturally internationalist. And so it was the French who helped take the game to Italy in the late 1940s uh, and 19, early 1950s. It was the French who took the game to Yugoslavia in the 1950s. And it was also the French who attempted to get the game going in Madagascar, which at that point was a colony of France. Uh, and so although, the, although these weren't successful, it wasn't, it was to reasons, it was for other reasons, mainly connected with the rugby union, that they didn't work out. But it wasn't due to any lack of enthusiasm or any lack of vision on the part of French administrators. So I think that's one of the, if you like, the um, the forgotten uh, stories of, of rugby league, that the French really did attempt to expand the game to very new territories uh, for rugby league in the 1950s. I guess in a sense they introduced c- continentalism. They'd, they'd played a role in encouraging rugby union players in Italy in the late 1940s to play rugby league and it's a case that one or two it's, uh, I think there was a, an Italian rugby union club that actually uh, played some games in France in the late 1940s and that led to the uh, the captain of the Italian national rugby union team taking an interest in rugby league and leading a team uh, of Italians over to uh, to tour Britain in 1950 where they played Wigan and about four or five other teams. And the game in Italy was actually quite... Uh, was actually By 1960, the game in Italy was actually quite strong, so much so that they published a monthly newspaper 
and they had around about a dozen teams playing regularly. They they actually the Italian national team in I think 1960-61 actually defeated the the French national amateur team. So the standard was quite high, but it, in Italy it failed because and this is a common reason and one that we still we still come across today. And in a sense, it's the same story of the that led to Saul Matdad being uh, imprisoned in uh, May this year. In earlier on this year, yeah. Um, the, 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 the Italian Rubini authorities complained to the government. In, in most European countries, you need a, a, a government licence to operate and to acquire funding and use municipal grounds and stadiums and so on and so forth. And so in Italy, the French, uh, sorry, the Italian Rugby Union complained that the Italian Rugby League weren't weren't properly registered and that if they uh and that the government should insist that because the Italian Rugby Union were recognised as the official rugby body by the government, then um they shouldn't be allowed to play and they shouldn't be allowed to access to municipal uh, facilities and all the rest of it unless they were part of the Italian Rugby Union and the, the Italian government because of the the way sport was organised and again because of the fact that the the well, the, the international board at the time didn't really put up a strong fight or or step in on the behalf of the Italians. The Italian game basically closed down because they couldn't get any facilities, they couldn't get any government funding, and it all went to the Italian rugby union. It took another. It was you know over thirty years before the game was revived in Italy. Then, in large part due to you know, Italian second generation Italian Australians uh, taking the game back to uh, Australia. In Yugoslavia, the, the French had kick-started the game in Yugoslavia, and rugby league in Yugoslavia, although it's traditionally a soccer nation, rugby league actually had quite a, a strong presence in the 1950s uh, and early 1960s. Uh, Partizan Belgrade, the well-famous soccer team, had their own rugby league team, and it was it was a minor sport, but it was a very successful minor sport. What was interesting about it was that the Yugoslav Rugby Association governed, administered both sports, Rugby League and Rugby Union. And it was the French who were responsible for launching Rugby League in Yugoslavia in 1953. A French student team went there, played some exhibition games, and the game was taken up. Obviously, Yugoslavia was soccer mad, and soccer was but far and away the most dominant game, but uh, Rugby League became an important minor sport. Partizan Belgrade, the famous soccer team, had their own Rugby League team. Yeah, there was a, a genuine rugby league culture in Yugoslavia. The interesting thing about Yugoslavia was that the Yugoslav Rugby Association administered both league and union. It was unique in the world. By and large, rugby league was strong in the Serbian part of Yugoslavia. Rugby union was stronger in the Croatian part of Yugoslavia, uh, which is actually still the case today. But in 1964, the Yugoslav Rugby Association partly, I suspect, through government pressure, but also just in terms of making themselves, uh, you know, spreading the popularity of the game, decided that it wanted to play more internationals and the, uh, the, certainly the rugby union team wanted to play more, the rugby union players wanted to play more internationals, and they applied to join the International Amateur Rugby Federation, which was like the, uh, the French-controlled European rugby organising body. And, of course... That one of their spe- one of their um, specifications was that if you're going to join FIRA, the name of the, org- the European organisation, you have to stop playing rugby league, and which they did. They weren't given any support by the rugby league international board, so the game died. Uh, but nevertheless, st- what I think what was interesting, you've got the the revival of the game in Serbia, uh, really over the last fifteen or so years, and it's the case that. There are still people around today who played rugby league in the 1950s and 1960s in Yugoslavia. So there is a real tradition and uh, the, the guys in Serbia have done a good job in maintaining that tradition and that culture. Uh, and, and, you know, and making the point that this is a, a game that has a, uh, you know, a 50 or 60 year history in that country. And, so, and that was really initiative of the French. Without the French, that would never have happened. The other um, country where the French started to get rugby league played was in Madagascar, which is the, the big island to the east of Africa, uh, which is historically a French colony. But rugby league never, uh, it was played for a few seasons, but it never really took off. I think partly because of the strength of rugby union, which had been taken there in the early 1900s by uh, French uh, colonialists, but had rapidly spread into the rest of the population. 
and so by the 1930s, it was played by native Madagascans. And um, given the uh, the the links that rugby union developed with the Madagascan independence movement, it was very difficult for rugby to get any traction there because for whatever reason, uh, rugby union had become associated with uh, almost an anti-French colonialist stance. So rugby league couldn't really fit in and get uh, get a foothold there. But nevertheless, the fact that you know the French attempted to uh, get the game played there uh, said a lot about their you know their inter- internationalist ambitions for the game. 